able to join us. I only heard from one person saying that they couldn't come. And Michelle, I think you found the recording. I did. You're being recorded now. Thank you. Where was it? It magically appeared. <gasps> okay. That's all I can tell That's you. Delicious. All right. Too, so I think I will get started. Um, I know as the year goes on, it just gets harder and harder for people to protect this time and get here. I also feel totally guilty about not sending out the reminder. Um, I don't know what that, Michelle, you just requested keyboard and mouse control? No, I didn't. Okay, I'm gonna deny it then. But I do see your um, face now. Do you yes, know I that? I just put my camera on. That would be why. Okay. All right. Oh, I don't want to leave the meeting. I just want to make that small. Okay. So um, I feel guilty that I didn't get the reminder out until I got home on Friday. And um, it occurred to me some people may not have had their book with them this weekend. So um, I sure hope, I'll say this to you guys, if you ever don't have a chance to read the content, please come to the COP anyway. Um, because sometimes you can just pick things up as you go along. So um, the link that I put in is I, I tweaked the meeting notes template because I, I feel as though when I'm trying to read the chat and then also put information into the, um, the notes, that my attention is just too divided and I feel like I'm not really connecting to you guys personally. And so I wanted to try a different option. So if you can see right now, what I've done is still put in a place where all of the, um, for chapter nine and then for chapter 10 is down below. It has the entire list of um, questions that we're going to be answering um and discussing but then down below each question is reprinted and then there's a table that has you know row, rows there for people to put information and this is so that if you wanted to say something you could type your name if you wanted to if not if you don't want it to be a part of the permanent record then don't but then you just type in your response the idea behind the Rose, we learned this at a Google training that Michelle and I attended is if I put in a table like that, then when people are applying, just select one when we're discussing each question and go into it for your thoughts. And that way we're not like writing on top of each other. Any questions about doing that? So um, Colleen and Courtney, it's great to have you here. I'm so psyched that you've um, joined. So Colleen, you're saying you can't see you today. Um, I don't know if what you're saying is that you're having trouble with your video or if you're on the phone. If you could unmute and let us know or type it in in the chat. Can't see video. So you can't see the screen at all that I'm talking about, Colleen? Can't see your note sheet. So Colleen, um, if you scroll up in, and Courtney for you as well, in the notes, um, the in the chat box, you'll see that at 11.57, I put in a note to everyone saying, this is a link to the new meeting notes template. Please open, and there's a hyperlink right there you can get and open on your computer. So Ellen, yeah, it's Michelle. Just for everybody to know, once you hit the link, you go into a Google document, which means you're not really able to see anything through the go-to meeting anymore because you're now online. But that's a but, and that should be okay because no, no, no. Do I was have, I was explaining yeah. that's probably why they were having that problem because okay. when I did that, I'm like, where'd my go-to meeting go? And then I, it had shrunk, and I had to go up and click onto the um, the internet to sh to get Google documents to show again. You know how right. you go back and forth and go to a meeting, it shrinks some screens and yeah, that's why. okay. All right. 
Hey, Ellen, this is Nelia. I just called in um, and I'm, I'm on the phone, so I can't access that link. Okay, so Nelia, in your case, please just, when you want to share something, please just unmute and, um, and then share it that way. Okay, thank and, you. And, and tell us. That would be, that would be awesome. So Sounds Colleen, good. I just put it in again, and Courtney, I just put in a new chat to everyone, and you should be able to see it there. Um, and anyone else, if at any time you want to unmute and speak, then at, at that time, um, I'll be happy to type in. Um, I've got to put my phone on airplane. It's the only way to silence it. Um, all right. So how are we doing? I see more folks have gotten in now. Anybody else other than Nelia who's on the phone having any difficulty getting in? And, it, and this document is also housed within our online resource that, excuse me, Articulate Rise module that has all everything from the whole year. All right. I'm going to assume that we are good to go then. So, um, so this month we were looking at chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 is on supporting adult learners and chapter 10 orchestrating meaningful meetings. Um, so our questions for chapter 9, I'll go through all of them and then we can uh, move down. What indicators of a learning organization are evident in your team, your school, your district? Um, as you read about the principles of adult learning, were there any connections to your own experience, any aha moments, any, I wonder if that's why a certain activity in your past went a certain way? Um, what are the implications about thinking of your team's zone of proximal development? And can you think of a time that maybe intentionally or not, you were actually taking into account where your team was in their evolution when you decided to handle things a certain way. Um, Elena Aguilar made a statement about holding others accountable that I thought was pretty um, different from what you usually hear in schools. And so I just wondered what people's gut reaction to that was in, in her uh, following explanation. How does resistance show up on your team and what kind of feelings does that bring up for yourself? And of the strategies that were shared for dealing with resistant, what ones come naturally to you? What are ones you'd like to develop? So again, in the, the Google Hangout, there are number of rows here. There should be enough. And if we need to make another one, you just go into the last one and hit tab and it adds. But what are people's thoughts? What are indicators of a learning organization for your team or your school? And there were things, they were on pages 186 and 187. Things about the environment, about learning practices and processes, and things about leadership. Lisa, I see that you have joined us. That I'm so excited to see you. Welcome. Thank um, you. You're welcome. 
while um, you're settling in, I um, we're experimenting with a new form of uh, note-taking for this meeting. Um, do you have access to your computer or are you on phone for this? I'm on my laptop right now, but awesome. I don't. This is a different screen. Um, um, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to share, I'm going to retype a link in here in the chat. Can you see the chat box for the go-to meeting? Um, I don't see the chat box. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Yes, I do see the chat box. Okay, and I just sent it to all. This is the link to the new meeting notes template. Okay. Should so I click on that link? Yep, but hold off for a minute. Michelle, okay. do you want to type just to Lisa to give her some guidance on that? And okay. I can start. Okay. Thanks. So, um, okay, so already, guys, I'm loving this new format because we have so much happening at once and I don't have to try to go back and forth. So let's look at what we have. Courtney shared our team has a strong purpose. We continue to revisit each year. This has been key due to many administrative and staff changes that we have. Great. So you guys feel as though you you have a, a common sense. And what I'm hearing is you think you got there's a common sense of purpose, and that helps you have a learning organization. Um, Paige was saying the MTSS team feels strongly that the work is important to all of us and will make a positive impact so again purpose and a good why that it's it's going to have a good outcome um colleen very positive group we're always looking for ways to do things better and essentially help students succeed lots of common purpose this is great and erin shared there's an openness to new ideas um, this mindset has helped us to try new things that have been successful. Pals reading in grades K3, another strong indicator observable on our team is purpose. We share a strong vision. Cool. Yeah, I think that um, when I was reading that and I was seeing this openness to new ideas, um, sometimes that can be a double-edged sword. I, I know I've been in some situations where there's been almost too big an open. Um, but and, and, and so we take on too much, if you will, at a time and overwhelm ourselves. But I agree. I think I see with a lot of your team an openness to new ideas and a willingness to try. Um, I'm curious and I'm, I'm reflecting that the notes template might make this a little bit difficult. But feel free to just return in your box and add more or to unmute. Um, do you feel as though those indicators of a learning organization extend beyond your team? Or do you feel as though when you get beyond the team, the indicators might not be as strong? I really want to. So Courtney is sharing the indicators beyond her team are not quite as strong. That 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 was something that I, I know I reflected on at that time, that I would be on teams where it, within the team, it was a great learning organization, but it's like, how do you get that to everyone? You're continuing to look at how you can branch out. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Cool. All right. Any other thoughts? Any quick feedback on how you feel about this note taking right now? Is there a way we can tweak it to make it better? And I can see the chat. So if you have access to that, you can go either way. You're good with it, Erin. Okay, thanks. Good to see. And Lisa has just jumped on the train while it's moving. Awesome. Okay. All right, great. So moving on, as you read about the adult principles of learning, 
were there connections to your experience that you've had in the past the adult principles of learning you know that adults need to feel safe to learn that we all come to learning with our own learning histories um that adults need to know the why that we want some control over our own learning um that we need practice um that adults tend to have a problem-centered orientation when they come to learning although some like to practice immediately and apply and others um, their learning style is to be more contemplative and, and not immediately jump in and apply um, and that generally adults do want to learn were there any big ahas for you in that I just think um, this is Nelia. I think it's just great that on the BLT team, um, we just have someone from each grade level. We have um, intervention, an interventionist. We have a UA teacher. So it just kind of made me think, I was thinking about that when I read the section about how adults come to learning experiences with histories, because we're all bringing something else to the table. Um, I, I totally agree, Nelia. And you even have some folks who are new to your building, because there was a grade added. Right, we do. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think, and I'm sharing this vocally because the others don't have the value of this. I think there has been some real sharing of how things are so different. And in some ways it's probably made it easier for the larger school to understand where the other people are coming from, as well as new folks to understand, well, what's the existing culture or way of, of doing business here? Right. It's been helpful. It really has been. And we even have a parent on the team, so it's great. We have a lot of different voices. Yeah. Do you, are there places where you see there are um, those different learning histories are problematic? Um, not as much on the team, but I do think that maybe when we bring it out to the rest of the staff and uh, we have an early release on Wednesday where we're going to be presenting a lot of our work to the staff. So I'm hoping that people will be on board with it because it's it's a little it's new. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we'll we'll see on Wednesday how our how the work that we've done, the feedback on that. Right. I can't wait to hear. Yeah. All right. Um, so others shared. Uh, Paige loves how these connected exactly to the experiences when teaching children. Right. They're just big kids, not really, but you thought the why we are learning and the implications for leaders to ensure that the rationale for learning is critical for buy-in from adult learners. Yeah, I know that when, um, when, when Michelle and I, anyone on the project, when we're planning a training, a PD, um, that's one of the first things, like, like what's the why? We have to present people with the why for why are we even taking time for this? And they need to, have a chance to interact with that. Erin, um, you said the idea that people come to the table with a valuable history and rich experiences was something that resonated. Recognizing that and validating to teachers creates more engagement. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because team members feel valued for what they do and not just left to feel like we want to change everything that they know about teaching. That's such a, an excellent point. Um, Lisa agrees with what you said, um, Paige. They they relate to similar to teaching children. I know I had that experience myself when I was reading it. I teach young adults, I'll say, undergrads, and I I had the same thoughts as well. Um, Courtney was taken with the section on one eighty nine labeled "The adult must feel safe to learn." discusses how staff may shut down if engaged in a discussion with a boss where they feel there may be negative consequences. May you reflect on your own role and that you're not a boss and may be able to have more open discussions with staff because they will not feel threatened by my work. You always thought they wouldn't take you as seriously because you were in a non-evaluative role. Um, right, it, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. Some folks may not see the value of coaching but i agree that folks if they if they feel threatened and i've seen this with teams where if if an administrator is is giving feedback it feels a little more personal for folks as long as you have trust on the team people like to hear from their colleagues um 
Colleen, you loved the bulleted list on page 191 the, uh, about the adults need to know why. I think sometimes we have a topic on the agenda, but maybe don't always share the specifics of what we're doing or why. And that's probably a good idea, yeah. Um, Michelle, you'd like to improve the structure of including reflection time. We're often trying to get through so much in a short amount of time that we don't feel as though we have time to do this. Yeah, somebody likes to pack a whole lot in, Michelle, and just not leave ample time. You should buy um, stock in suitcase companies. I should buy stock in suitcases, oversized. Um, yeah, and and I think that always is a balance. And I wonder, you, I, I suspect you guys encounter this as well, where um, you're, you've got something planned and, and you're trying to decide, can I get all of this accomplished? I, I, I suspect I'm not the only one who puts too much in. Um, but yeah, you, you need time to reflect and give people some time on that. Great, great discussion. Anyone else have any thoughts? I will watch for moving cursors for a few. This is awesome. I also feel like we're getting a lot more volume. So way to go. Um, okay, so next one, as you read about the principles, did I just do that? I put yep. that one in twice. So I'm going to just, whoops, cut that. Excuse me, delete rows. Okay, are there implications of thinking about your team's zone of proximal development? Can you think of a time when um, you did this, not your did this, um, perhaps without even realizing that you had? Or maybe a time when you wish you had done that, <laughs> but you didn't. every time <laughs> Aaron I don't believe it this is the part where they also talked about having an asset based approach as opposed to a gap based approach um, when planning for your team I think, Colleen, in that earlier question, when you were talking about looking at people's strengths for roles on the MTSS team, that was an, a, an example of really operating from an asset-based approach to learning. What are people's strengths? Um, what are their natural strengths? And, and so how can we engage them by, by encouraging them to use them? So Colleen agrees that it's really um, important to consider the team's zone of proximal development. Um, I don't know if I had ever done it consciously previously, you know, and said, oh, what's this team's zone? Where are they at? But um, Paige also said, yes, and part of the problem is that we have not taken the time to define a vision and expectations clearly for individuals. Want, um, I plan to work on helping others shift thinking from blaming external focuses to focusing on our own sphere of control. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, what do you have control over? What do you have influence over? What do you have control? And what don't you? Um, yeah, awesome. Erin, you like the opportunity to share PD plans with someone else first for that very purpose. Oh, that's, that's a neat idea, get an external perspective. For example, I just had this experience when I did, my boss suggested I create a mock scenario of the protocol I wanted the team to do. 
This was a great idea and really set the team up for understanding success. That's neat. I, and, and do you feel as though, Erin, and others potentially, you have someone else on whom you could bounce off? How do you think this would work for the team? I am very lucky. <laughs> oh, cool. You have three people you can do this with. That's awesome. So Lisa shared that she's always used the zone of proximal development with teaching students, but never really thought about doing this when planning meetings. It's an interesting concept. Absolutely. Cool. And Michelle, you said you think it's helpful to consider this um, from a team perspective and not getting stuck on that one person who could de derail. So more looking at it collectively, where are we at, rather than each individual person. Great. <laughs> All right. All right, here's, here's the one that I found interest, most interesting, guys. What was your gut reaction? So I'll tell you where it was. On page 197, holding others accountable. Um, in the first paragraph in that section called holding others Ap accountable, um, about midway through, Elena says, if you've experienced this tension, then I hope what I'm about to share will come as a relief. You can't hold anyone accountable to anything. And she goes on to talk about, um, you know, there's commitment, there's compliance, and there's the appearance of compliance. Um, but what, what did you feel reading that? I'm particularly curious from the administrators who are part of our COP how that felt. All right. So, Erin, you said you can't hold anyone accountable to anything. Question marks. So, those question marks? I thought I just heard a bleep, like something was happening. I don't know. Um, it's frustrating, but you definitely see the value of inspiring commitment, too. Not always easy, but you agree with Paige and you liked the quote. Paige had said, the opposite of accountability is commitment. This was an interesting perspective. The next section on resistance helped make it more clear. Okay. 
And then Courtney had also said, Erin, I share your comment. Although I can understand holding back, it certainly seems that sometimes we do need to hold others accountable. I think we're certainly told, you know, and anyone who's in a position of leading a group or certainly supervising a group, you need to hold your people accountable. Um, I think Mich Michelle, what I saw what you said, I wonder if she's viewing this from the behavioral perspective that you can't control the behavior of another only yourself, but you can change the conditions surrounding that behavior. I remember when I was reading it, your comment, I was thinking back to um, parenting with love and logic. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but um, in that approach, it's saying you can't control what kids are going to what's gonna come out of their mouth or, or what they'll swallow or something like that. But you can control things like whether or not you continue to drive the car if kids are screaming or whether or not you're going to take them somewhere that they wanna go or things like that. So it go, goes back, I think, to spheres of control. It's related to that. Um, Colleen, you shared that as you read, you wrote in your notes that we need buy-in and commitment so it becomes what they want to do and not what they have to do. Right, agreed. And Lisa, you said accountability is key if you wanna have a successful team. You do understand the part of resistance, but if 99% of your team is on board, you'll be okay. Um, and, and I think that's one of the strategies when she gets into resistance about not focusing so much on the resistors. Trust me, I've worked with my share of people that are resistant, resistant but I've worked with more people that are willing to be held accountable. Um, and, and yeah, that, that they allow themselves to be held accountable as opposed to someone externally is doing it. Any other thoughts? All right. So how does resistance show up on your team? She described briefly some of the things that resistance can look like confusion, like I'm not sure, or, what do you mean? Or, or continued questioning that's not productive um, or just never being satisfied. Um, how does resistance look, or, or are you not finding you're encountering resistance on your teams, in your school, that sort of thing? <laughs> so Lisa, you said um, it, it struck you when she said it's often a need for help, never thought of it that way. Um, is it possible that now thinking back, you may have had resistors that in hindsight with that lens, maybe they were actually struggling and so needed help with that. I know that was one of my re reactions when I read it, that there are people I've worked with in the past that I thought were just trying to be difficult when in fact, I think they were really um, frightened and it, related to the frightened but they really needed help and didn't know how to ask or didn't feel as though asking for help would be productive or received well yeah yeah that was my thought we can't beat ourselves up though i keep telling myself it's learning we're learning um so Paige said, your existence is resistors try to rally the troops to create discord i like that she pointed out that resistance is an indirect expression of fear I thought they were just miserable. So in the next next month, because I always, right before we have these meetings, I read ahead for the questions. Um, there's an example when she's talking about having challenging conversations um, of exactly that, that when I read it, I thought, I'm not sure I would have been able to handle it the way she did, of someone 
you'll know it when you read it next month, directly trying to rally the troops and, and resist um, what she as a coach was trying to do. Um, and I agree. I think a lot of our resistors are, um, can be the loudest. It's beyond resisting. It's like sabotagers or overtly, you know, aggressive against. Um, and that can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, Courtney, you've experienced a lot of the confusion and repeatedly asking questions. At times, side conversation was needed to calm a team member. It was clear that this person was simply nervous and unsure of themselves. Yep. I, and did, did they, were they able to come to that understanding? I'm curious about, okay, um, I don't need to resist this. They're still working. Um, yep. Erin, you've noted resistance in several forms that one that seems hard for you to know how to deal with is the passive aggressive kind. When people nod and agree at the table and then go back to their little world and, and um, do what they've always done. Yeah, that's pretty frustrating. Um, anybody have any suggestions for what you've done when you've encountered the folks who their resistance is passive aggressive. So they say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Okay. And then just, you, they have no intention whatsoever because that can be um, toxic to the team long-term. If anyone has any thoughts for that, for Erin, I'm making another um, row here. If you wanna put something in there. So Colleen, you said, depends on the team. One team does not show resistance. Another seems to come and be compliant, uh, which we learned doesn't transform schools. Lots of questions and concerns come up. Eventually we get to a better place, but it seems like a lot of time gets wasted. Yeah. Oh, I, I assumed you weren't talking about your current team, Erin, but we'll make that clear. She wasn't talking about her current team. Okay. Michelle says, one of the things you did in this section was to put yourself in the role of resistor. That's a neat perspective to see how I may have reached, uh, I may have reacted in certain situations. We don't all wholeheartedly embrace everything we've been asked to do in life. It helps me to try to see through others' eyes when trying to problem solve. I also really like that she had to stick what she had to say about toxic organizations um, and when to ask certain types of systems questions. Yeah. Michelle, do you want to unmute and talk a little bit about that? Because I don't think I went into that further. Uh, yeah, I just um, I mean the, the individual resistance versus toxic organization section. Yeah. Yep. I think that I have personally been asked to come into toxic organizations and fix a problem when the problem was deeper than what an individual outside of the system could support. And I liked how she went through asking deeper level questions before maybe putting yourself in that position, because in retrospect, there were definitely times where I should not have been subjected to something, but that was definitely when I was younger in my educational career. But I, mm -hmm. I think that she does raise a really good point that there are sometimes organizations that are toxic for various reasons. And understanding that organization as a system itself, as opposed to trying to go and solve lots of individual problems within that system, you've got to take a step back and look at the system first. Because that really is not a, a fair position to put the, the problem fixer in. Well said. Cool. All right. Next question. Of the strategies for dealing with resistance, what comes natu naturally to you and what are some that you'd like to develop? She had things like, where is my list of these things? Nope. I found them earlier. Nope, I'm thinking of something else. So don't focus on the resistors. 
recognize some people are not coachable, <laughs> distinguish, oh, oh, this was part of the same thing. I'm confusing it with something in the next chapter. So being compassionate but clear with folks, give direction, clear direction, there'll be less confusion. Courtney would like to improve on not focusing on the resistors and continuing to stay positive with the others. Nice. We are a compassionate group. Erin also would you likes to use compassion, try to offer as much support as the person feels they would like. Um, and Michelle brought up, we've shared this with you guys, I know in the past, but the managing complex change grid that looks at the, the type of resistance you're seeing or, or the type of reaction that you're seeing from folks. And is it because you don't have, you know, vision, skills, resources, an action plan, adequate support, that sort of thing. That's something that we could um, drop into this section of the module if people would like to have access to that again. But yeah, that is a great, um, particularly when looking at a team saying, if things aren't making progress, what, what might be getting in the way here? It's a quick view to say what, what might it be, gut check, good. All right, so my time management skills are still something that I should work on. Um, chapter 10, orchestrating meaningful meetings, we have less time for, so I'll try to make the pace a little perkier, but what makes a, a good meeting for you as a participant, not as a coach or a facilitator, but if you're a participant of a meeting, what makes it a good meeting for you? So people like meetings that are clear and focused, the stated outcome, where we're learning, doing, a realistic agenda. Um, yeah, I'm, as I read that, a realistic agenda, and I think of the times that I've put forth an agenda that was too um, ambitious, and we don't get to things, how it, it would feel for the person who the thing that we didn't get to was the thing that they were really looking forward to. That could be really frustrating. Um, practical agenda with strong time management. Also, like when we can take something away from a meeting, a new skill. Yep. It's good to feel as though this was time that was well spent because as we all know, we don't seem to have enough time for all the things that we want to do or believe we should be doing. Uh, when the leader has a plan and is organized, the structure helps the, the agenda. Um, not getting off topic and feel like we missed what we needed to accomplish. Cool. Lisa, your best meetings are when you feel your work is meaningful and makes a difference. So um, that you feel as though, even though you weren't the facilitator, you had a contribution, that, that there was reason for you being there. Great perspectives. How about when you guys are holding a meeting? They talked about outcomes and there being buckets you know, six big buckets for meetings, share information, learn something, solve problems, make decisions, plan or build community. But what about those unstated outcomes? That just really resonated for me. 
What do you want people to be saying to one another when they walk to their cars or when they go home and someone says, hey, how was your meeting? Um, and it might not be the same for every meeting, but maybe you can think of a meeting that I was really hoping that this is how people would feel or how they'd remember it. So Courtney said she'd like for people to stay how valued their opinion and their time felt, that they um, felt that they were really a part of a solution. Nice. And Colleen, you want them to be enthusiastic about what was discussed and how they plan to contribute and not just being glad they are um, gone from the meeting. <laughs> you want them to be happy, but not just happy that it's over. Um, Paige said you'd love for them to take the initiative to be involved in whatever it is we're working on. So not so they'd have to believe in the why and the what and be inspired to actually move and have, have the skills they need for that. Um, Michelle said one of the biggest takeaways from this section was how does what we'll do here today connect with student learning? I want to do a better job at keeping that in the forefront. Um, yeah, one of one of the things that at a keynote once I heard someone say is when you're looking at what um, practices to put in place, choose the ones that have the closest direct line to student outcomes. And and we oftentimes don't think in terms of well, what's going to be the impact here. Lisa shared, I want them to be excited about the work we're doing, feel they were appreciated, and it was time well spent. Um, Erin, you hope they feel positive and hopeful. This isn't tangible, but you can tell because you'll have good participation during the meeting and people leave chatting. Yeah, if they leave and they're talking, um, I agree that, that that's often a good sign that, that um, and they're talking about what what we were doing like the meeting doesn't end right when it ends that's interesting all right next of the meeting activities reviewed which one spoke to you which have you used already or which might you think about trying they were things this is the list that i was confusing before things like making meeting a uh, making meaning identifying implications determining implications using like a consultancy protocol that problem solving that we've talked about using but no one ever seems to bring a problem um, a feedback protocol discussion protocols routines to build culture things like that these were starting where were these starting on page like 211 went on I'm just ignore me for a minute while you guys are typing because I want to find that protocol. It was at the bottom of the other notes, but it's not on the bottom of this one.
All right, where are all of the little cursors? There they are. All right, so Paige, you'd like to use routines to build culture. Um, sometimes that can feel uncomfortable, but I think that you know the building culture and the building trust, everything she talks about along the way, that's, that's the bottom line. What was that quote before culture eats something for breakfast? I forget, but it's like culture is king. Um, the feedback consultancy protocols, you think that's sometimes undervalued and imperative for risk to continue receiving feedback and reviewing decision making. Yeah, and there are those, she's got a lot of things in the appendices, but Courtney, at the bottom of these notes, I put the problem solving sharing protocol. They're all slight tweaks. This is the one that we had talked about using if someone brought a problem that they wanted the other coaches input on. So that's there. And Michelle has put that managing complex change grid at the bottom of our notes as well. Thank you for doing that. Um, Aaron, you've used the walk and talk. I was curious if anyone had used that. Um, and, and is that like an, at the end of the day, kind of use the walk and talk and keep people doing something as long as they come back? A group check-in? Everyone share one moment from your day or week. That seems to be great. Yep, we've done that. Lisa, you like the community agreements norms. It's important. Those are important to revisit. And yeah, in those next couple of chapters, you'll see too, she talks about how there are times when it's just important to revisit the norms. Are the norms we made still the norms we need because we might be in a different phase of, de of our team development? And Michelle, you put, I remember one of our coaches trainings, we practiced the dyads and active listening and feedback. The feedback was overwhelming, that it was hard to do, just listening without trying to solve someone's problem and address it right now. Yeah, I remember that. And I remember being reminded of when my kids were in college and they'd call home and go, ah, everything's wrong. And I would try and solve it. And one of them finally said, I don't want you to solve it. I just want you to listen. Um, there's just value in that. Yeah. All right. So next, um, are there areas of your meetings in which you can share facilitation responsibilities? <clears throat> that part of this chapter interested me because we, we were very specific with everyone saying, no, you have to have defined roles <clears throat> and a backup. And the reason for that is if we're a jack of all trades, we'll be a master of none. Um, but are there, are there, is there a strategic way to share responsibility, basically? Would it be good to have parts of the meeting or different activities really facilitated by other people? How might that change or improve your teams? As you guys are typing, I know Michelle and I are working right now on a presentation about what are some implementation issues that districts face. And one of them is not having a deep bench. So if one, a deep bench meaning you've got multiple people that could play the role of, I'll use a football analogy of, of quarterback or tight end or defensive end. I don't even know what these mean other than quarterback. But um, if you don't have a deep bench and and somebody, you know, hits the lottery or gets traded or signs a contract with the Miami Dolphins, maybe, then, you know, are you still going to be able to fulfill that role? So that might be one of the benefits of sharing some facilitation responsibilities. So Paige, you said it comes easily and naturally with Colleen. Yeah, I think you guys have such a nice uh, situation where you, you're both able to attend teams. But I just want to point out that wasn't always the case. That wasn't always possible. Uh, but over time, that's become more possible, which is exciting. Colleen, you said you think different people may be able to facilitate based on the agenda from the previous meetings. 
find with MTSS, different people leave with various tasks, and then they may facilitate and share that work at the next meeting. And you agree that it's easier to share with her because you guys are on the same page as far as what facilitation is about. Yeah. Um, Aaron, you feel it's the best way to go. It makes for a balance. Lisa, you've shared roles on the team. However, you think it depends on the team members and how well they get along. True. And Michelle brought up a point that something that I've encountered is when you're the full-time facilitator or say you're the full-time note taker, sometimes it's hard to engage in the conversation and have input because you're, you don't want to um, diminish the importance of the role of the facilitator or the role of the note taker. You want to make sure the group gets the facilitation they need, but there are some times when the person who's facilitating really wants to participate or has a need to participate as a member. Same thing with notes. I used to be able to take notes and participate. And then somewhere along the way, the aging process, that went poof, gone. Um, so there have been times when I've been note taker that I've said to someone, can you take notes right now? Because I really need to be able to talk during this. I can't talk and type at the same time. Hence the note template we have now. <laughs> um, cool. All right. And Colleen, I liked what you said about people leave with various tasks. I think we're, I'm always in the habit of saying, so you'll share that back when you come back. But um, only now have I started, and maybe it's since reading that, because I just did this with someone, um, was talking with them about, okay, at the next meeting, when you bring that back, can can you think about a way to facilitate that activity so that it's not just a, here's what happened? Um, I like the idea of thinking ahead for that. Um, and, oh, Courtney had to go. So that's what I was seeing. Okay, last question. And we have two minutes. I'm so excited. Are there organizational issues that contribute to the storming phase of your team? Issues with your larger organization, um, maybe the climate or the culture, whether at your current team or, or in the past. What she had said was, storming has a great deal to do with organizational conditions in which the team exists. When the condition's optimal, the team might storm quickly. In contrast, if you're leading a team that seems to be doomed to eternal storming, it may be that the organizational conditions for team development are poor. That may have hit me hard because I can remember being on teams that were forming in the context of extremely hostile um, labor relations. Um, and so it might not be a question that really resonates with anyone but me. Don't see a lot of storming. Some may be that people don't don't share or don't do it outwardly. Erin, um, you've seen pretty much all of it in the same group, but there were no norms. There was unchecked emotion, uh, but now it's all good. So you guys progress through the storming. That's good. Um, hey, do you have one team that does a lot of storming? Some of it has to do with the fact that they were chosen <laughs> they they were the chosen ones the voluntold ones much of it is fear yeah yeah and and i know in my situation where i was encountering these issues was um we were trying to build a very collaborative uh learning organization and um everything outside of the team was very top down very evaluative very um 
you know, not enough time, not enough resources, kind of um, compliance at best focused. So it was, that was hard for me. Um, well, guys, it's one o'clock. Um, thank you so much for your active and engaged participation. Um, next time we get together, we will be looking at chapters 11 and 12. Um, the, the discussion questions are in our online resource. I will also do a follow-up email and send them to you. And Michelle has recorded this session, so we'll be up uploading that to the March thing. Um, and certainly if you guys have any thoughts, particularly if you have any thoughts about how to improve that note taking even better, or if you personally had issues with that that you don't want to share with a group, please email me. I would love to know what worked and what didn't about that. All right. Thank you.